All right. So uh, our next uh, speaker is uh, François Defoe from uh, Siena. Uh, so he's uh, presenting uh, dynamic visual space tracing. Uh, so. Uh, so. Okay. So today we're going to talk about dynamic tracing, but first we will talk about the, the static tracing that's that's readily available and that's uh, what we use uh, to inspire the um, approach we took for the dynamic tracing in section two. Mm -hmm. So in section section two there will be two different, uh, two different approaches first. One is to use P trace and map and so forth. And then we implemented the same thing we need using diamonds. So we're going to cover that as well. And then uh, if we, we have time we can talk about uh, a, a similar thing we have on Bigsworks. And at the end, uh, we're going to compare the different courses. <coughs> so basically, the goal here, just to make sure it's clear, we want to instrument the code without having to be compiled, you know, doing live on a, on a running application. So the only thing we do is we, we, we actually help the application from running, change instrument the functions, and get it to run again. And uh, you know, the ultimate goal is to get a thin graph, a function called graph in the stack. And I put a reference here because trace from pass has a view called a view. So the context where we are from see you now where where we implemented the tool is that most of our um, you know cards are R P C based. So I will cover R P C meaning in this presentation. And then a lot of our cards also have um, small flash disks or tiny RAM as well as systems. And then RAM is limited. Uh, you know, some cards even have, have, have <coughs> 64 gigabyte or 5 of RAM. So in this this is in this context that we want to do the dynamic trace. So as an overview, okay, there are two approaches that we're going to discuss today. Um, they are almost the same, but they are somewhat different. So, one approach is you take the function that you want to instrument, and you instrument the entry and the exit. At the entry, you call uh, the uh, tracing entry function, and on the exit, you have the other exit function. So, okay, so it could be, so, you know, like in all the tricks that we have to cover in this presentation, either it's a function call or it's a signal to uh, involve tracing. And then another approach that we took is uh, in, instead of do, doing it from the entry and the exit of the functions, we actually look at the branch. Um, so we instrument the branch instead of instrumenting the entry and exit of the functions that we want to instrument. Uh, so again, it could be a function call or an interrupt or uh, a signal. So this is particularly uh, very useful we found when we don't have the uh, symbol information. So this is uh, when we use this. <coughs> so for the static tracing, so, so this technique is really available today. Anybody can use that. Um, but why we talk about this one is because it inspires our uh, dynamic tracing techniques. So here you have a function that you want to instrument. So with the compiler option, f instrument function, you, that's what you get. At the beginning and the end of the function, you get a function or a call that is added by the compiler. And then uh, basically, this is the signature of the entry and uh, exit functions. You have the this pointer, the this function pointer, and the call side. So the this function pointer is the address of the callee, and the call site is the address of the call the function you are in uh, the call. Lead. So this is what you need to pass to your tracing functions in order to, to trace an LTC and this. So it's called the lib LTTNG USC SIG profile shared library. So uh, with the LD preload uh, loader uh, environment variable, you can then 
load this library and it's going to replace the call to the function phone in that library. Um, replacing the original stubs, I believe they're just stubs to the function of the phone, it's just to, before you do a tip reload. Um, so obviously when you did that, you go to TNG start and then you get a trace of the all the function entry and exit. So, okay, this is great, but we know this is the orientation, so you have to compile the code. Um, so, login is also done on all the threads in the process, you don't have control of which thread is uh, you trace within the process. And also, there is a lack of ability of when you want to start the trace, when you want to stop the trace. Basically, when you do a TT and you start, you are basically tracing it. So now let's get into the dynamic tracing techniques. Um, so to, in this section, I have two two different techniques. Uh, one of them. So yeah. So the thing is, we do the same thing, but now it's without compilation. So that's that's the advantage of the next thing. And then you can select the threads that you want to trace. You don't have to trace everything. And also we can add logic to start and stop the trace depending on certain returns. So the slides, that slide is very busy. I think this is a busy one. I don't know if this one's not very busy, but so I just wanted to mention that we we have this is implemented today. We have it implemented on Power PC and x86. Again in this presentation I focus on the Power PC. Um, both are implemented at CNA, x86, and on PC. Uh, so it allows us to trace uh, with the TNG and then with the environment. So the context. Okay, so basically this is not, everybody knows about that, but I just wanted to show um, that you've got your process with your threads, and you have your binary, the exit files, it's loaded into the memory. And that's what the process is running. And then you have the process utility, so you have from a different process you want to be able to trace another one. So you have the tracing utility process, where you need to be a flash shell, where you have the commands, and then you have the, the process of the tracing. So now the first approach, this is basically all done by yourself, you know, we use lots of dual level tricks. So again, you have your function that you want to trace. And now we make use of the same library as before, the, uh, the SDT ng UST shared library, where we have the uh, enter function and the exit functions. Um, so what we want to do, okay, so this is this slide is showing what we want to set up. So basically what we want to do is you have your function and you have the function, tracing function in the shared library. We want to group the two together. Um, so for the entry point, we have um, a prolog, like a function, and, then so, and we have a function pair, a function that we want to trace. And to save memory, we actually have um, the portion in the middle where it says C entry routine, that's like shared code. So the trick again, like the trick here is to make sure that we can pass the the, the address of the call E and the address of the caller, we don't lose track of that. So um, one of the things we did is here in the prologue, uh, we have one prologue for function we're tracing, that the address that we are, um, the address of the function actually is hard coded in the prologue. And also as well in the, uh, the API as well. So the next thing we have we, we want to do is actually the first instructions is uh, modified to call the uh, entry trace point. And then again, the uh, if you contains a, the first okay, the first instruction that we overall we have to actually write it in the API. So that's what we do. And then for the exit trace point, we have something very similar, um, same kind of idea. And then. Again, in Power PC, the instruction for return is a BLR, branch to link uh, register. And then uh, we, make, we call the 
exit trace point at this point. So the, yeah, the, we must find the solution to call the uh, exit trace point. Then at the end, it returns normally to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to the call. So this is what we want to set up. Also, we add, uh, we make use of another LTTNG library, I think CTL for control, where you have the LTTNG start and LTTNG stop functions. So you can start and stop when you want. Um, basically, that's uh, so. This completes the you know, the flow. Basically, the next phase is to explain how we set that up. So there are like three stages. The first stage is uh, you know the program is running, right? And then we have to load into it the, the shared library, and then then we have to generate the code that uh, will uh, do our tracing. And then we have to instrument the function we want to use. So the technology needed in all the three stages. So we need to be able to count to threads from executing so we can modify the source. And then we need to be able to do, a, I call it enter process uh, procedure calls, for a lack of a better term. Basically from the call, from the tracing process, you, the, the function will be of your application that you want to use to trace and the process that you want to trace you need to be able from there to do the L, the DLM, DLSIM, and map and so forth. Uh, we need to be able to modify the process, target process memory as well. Basically this is all I think is using features. So just as a, a quick ptrace overview, ptrace is a, a system call, and the, this function is going to look like this. And essentially, with ptrace, it allows us to do pick and poke as a memory, attach to a process, and detach. That's basically what ptrace allows us to do. So now let's see. Okay, so one of the tricks that we have is uh, to do the enter process procedure call. So that's a bit tricky. Uh, basically, we have our process running. So the process that you have your text segment, it's actually running where the PC is pointing to. And then you have your thread stack uh, and your stack pointer. So we are the sequence of steps that we do. So first, uh, we attach the thread. So again, so we use ptrace P -trace attached for that. Now we want to save the context of this thread. So we save all the registers into heap somewhere. Um, for future use, when we are done the call, we want to restore the state of the, uh, the process. So that's why we save it. And we need to know the, the PC, the program pointer as well. So then after that, what we do, we create a temporary stack uh, frame on the stack. Uh, the trick in there is that the, where you normally save the link register, actually you put a track instruction in there. So, and then after that, uh, we, um, we change the processor context so we can now call the procedure that we want that process to call. So we have to set the, the GPRs the, for the parameters, the arguments are put on the stacks, the argument, the argument data, and then the PC is configured so we now it points to the function we want to call, and now we do a ptrace count. So basically we're zooming the trace, now it's running all process, uh, sorry, the, the procedure. And then uh, it creates its own stack, blah, blah, blah. When it returns, now it's completed running the procedure and then we have it gets the trap instruction. And then the trap instruction invokes a P trace, and this is where we get invoked again, and we restore the CPU based on the previously saved registers. Um, then we restore the PC, 
the program counter and the resume in the thread execution. So basically, seamlessly, we just call the function within the, the context of the other process that we want to choose. Um, the, the rest of the things that we need to know, basically, we need to know where we can, because in But we need to allocate memory basically for for stage two. So where do we allocate that memory? We look at the slash proc for that. Uh, so from slash proc, we basically look at where we have like um, unused unused sections or gaps, and then the threads that uh, are under the process again. It's under all the slash proc that we get this information. So this is the, 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 the wraps up that the, the technique. At the end, I have like more slides, and I don't want to cover them during this presentation. But I have slides for extra details about RPC and actually this is the covering. So, any questions in the part? Is it clear? Yeah. So, um, which is the overall? Uh, impact that the automatic cloning has over the... Yeah, the, the performance impact. So really, okay, the, the real performance impact, the thing is we are our interest here, I didn't mention that, I should have clearly just clarified that. We want to reverse engineer the code. We are interested also to get performance number as well to optimize the performance, but the number we get, they are, they are, that they are, they are, very, they are good enough. The, so the cost, we're not so concerned about the cost of, of making the function call and all of that in this case. It's likely we tried, you know, we made it as fast as possible, but we're more concerned about being able to trace the code and anything without having compiling it so we can reverse engineer it and also we can uh, improve performance as well, but in a context where, you know, like instrumentation cost is not so much fast. I also have another question related with one statement you made. Uh, you said that you don't need to recompile the code. No, no need to recompile. That's when it's already compiled with the trace points, right? No. Oh. So we start, that's the that's the whole thing that the whole trick we are doing, we are doing is that we take the application, you know, with no instrumentation whatsoever. Regardless of the optimization you also use with the compiler, you know, dash mode 2 or 3, whatever, we just walk the, the, the code and we find what the functions are and we instrument the code from that. Good. Any more questions? Um, so, the next thing is we presented that before to the LTT energy community and someone suggested that we could use uh, diamonds, and I think it's you suggested that, right? So, Su Chakra. Su Chakra. Su Chakra. So, Su Chakra suggested we can use diamonds for that. So, we said, okay, have a look. So, we experimented with it, and I'm going to share what we found with that. So, I have the same again, we have our process binary, binary file. We have the process and the threads, the program is loaded in RAM, and the process is running that program. Then we have our tracing HPT. So what is the sequence of steps that we use to enable the tracing using Diamond's API? So Diamond's API is, is very well documented. Um, the steps that are there, I don't think they are quite, you know, I don't think the Diamond's document explains these steps like we did. So I think that slide has a, uh, has a bit of value for that. Um, so basically, again, uh, what we do is we load the shared libraries. Um, same libraries as before. Nothing new here. But now this time it's done from Diamond's. It's using Diamond's API. We're all doing that using Diamond's API. And then we also added our own library, which is uh, and just for the sake of this presentation, I call it Orbit to be shared bit. Basically, we have a function for the entry and a function for the exit. And to add our extra logic around it. You know, if tracing is enabled, if we're tracing, blah, blah, blah. And again, on the exit, same kind of a thing. So we can 
added some logic, some logic around the, the trace. When to start and stop and all of that. So the second uh, step involves uh, attaching to the process. So at, at this point, the process is not running. So we have um, there is a, a function, an API in Dynance where you can find all the function within the shared library. So we use it to find our own function in our own library, like address the address and so forth. And then we're doing the same thing on the binary that we want to implement. Uh, one thing is that uh, Dynance, the way we find that it works is that it converts that to a WARF file. And then use the WARF file information to figure out where the functions are and so forth. Um, and then with Dynance, uh, they have what they call insert insertion sets. So you have to begin, uh, you have to create your insertion sets of all the functions that you want to instrument. So again, just I show just one function there, just for the sake of the presentation. Obviously, you want to do that for all the all the function in the code. And then with Dynance, what you do, you create. Uh, what they call uh, insertion points. So basically this is where you want to add your instrumentation. Uh, and then you have uh, what they call uh, snippets. So we have now an entry snippet, an exit snippet. And again, same idea, you need the this function pointer on the call side, because the goal is to call the same functions to trace in the LTTNG library that we used in previous examples. Um, so at the end, there is an API in Dynance called Finalize Instruction Set. At this point, the code is instrumented. So the way Dynance works is actually replace the code. So it instruments the code and it duplicates it. So when the function A, the original one, is not instrumented and it creates a one with the basic key wrapper at the beginning and at the end. Um, so when you call detach, the process resumes and now it executes the code that you have with your instrumentation. Um, do I have that? Because I, there, I think I'm good, right? You should be good. good. Okay. So we also have um, dynamic tracing on the Xbox. So this is an LTC. This, this is a Linux conference, but. Uh, and we'll cover it anyway, because this is a tracing summit. So basically, um, on VixWorks, we had, we had this for several years. Same idea again, but in Linux it's easier because you, you know, uh, there is only one process space, so everything is global. And uh, so this is on the cards where we have this memory as well, where we actually are, we use that. Um, so here, this is where we uh, instrument from the branch instructions instead of from the beginning and the exit of the function, what I was talking about at the beginning. Um, so on RPC, so this is a, just a brief introduction to uh, the, the RPC 32-bit code. So you have the relative calls, the, the, the DL and the DLA. So those are that allows you uh, to basically jump plus or minus 32 megabyte. And then you have the long calls. So the first one that you have is the DLRL. Essentially, this one you know the, in the link register the address where you want to go to, and you use that instruction to jump to that address. So those are used for long calls. And then the DLR, that's your return instruction on the RPC, and those are long calls using the, uh, the and what it uses the link register to jump and it updates the link register. It returns from the previous instruction. So, our goal in this approach now is to instrument, um, basically trace all the VL, VL, VLR, and all the jumps basically. Um, but we have two techniques that we use. So that we use a different technique for VL and VLA instructions because we wanted to minimize the cost of uh, the tracing. And I, I, I can explain also why we did that later on in this slide. So the first technique for this it involves a springboard, basically just a table in memory, where in that 
the springboard is used to replace all the VL and VLA. So what we have in there is we have an array, and for each function that we instrumented, we basically have a branch to it directly. So that's all it is. Um, so the key thing here, again, we don't want to lose the, comp the content of the LR. So that's why we have a branch to the function that we want to call, and this way the LR stays the same. Uh, so when tracing is disabled, okay, we change the DL and, and the DLAs to, uh, to DLAs to the entry in the table in the, on the springboard. So now to enable trick, tra so basically now we really can see that we just jump to the springboard and go to the function that we meant to call. Now, now when we want to enable tracing, we basically mark this springboard as embedded memory, and it triggers at this point an ISI exception. And basically now we jump to, to the exception table where we have our tracing code. Uh, so why we didn't use this approach for the, the long calls on our PC? Uh, I can't go into the details there. Um, but basically you have to know the value of an R in advance. And there is no practical, practical way of doing that. So what we did as a compromise is uh, we changed basically all the DLR and the DLRL, DLRLs with uh, ban restrictions, causing directly uh, a program exception. So there, that's simple, I mean, we know where we came from, and we know the value of that R because we didn't affect it. Uh, we can trace and then return to where we were. Um, So basically this sums up. Is there any question on this one? So to be complete, we, we, we want to talk about the because we talked about dynamic instrumentation of the code. So GDD allows to instrument the code with LTT and G. Now the thing is to be honest, we didn't play with this, so we don't we don't know too much about it. Um, so a quick Google search yields some you know, results, so it's very easy to find the documentation. Even um, Shukara, yes, you have a presentation about this, right? Um, yes. The first link is yours. Yes. And on Google, it just came up. <laughs> <laughs> so in Google, so the next step for us would be to get familiar with it, but we don't cover it because we cannot do it just as you know. So if you want to do, so at the end of this presentation, all I wanted to do is to compare the different approach. Um, the static, we've pretty much covered it already. It's open source, it's really available. Uh, nice thing about it, it's portable to all architectures, supported by uh, GCC, and I did a quick check. So the F instrumentation, instrument function has been there for a while. And as far as I can tell, it's there since GCC 3.0.4. Before that, I wasn't even to find, able to find any implementation, so it's been there for a while. The LD preload also is a well-established um, loader environment variable, so there's so this trick here are, are not new. Um, again, the cons we talked about them, you know, you have to recompile your code and it, you have limited uh, control about what you trace and when you start and stuff. Um, the first approach that we talked about with PMEM and all of that, um, it's designed very, very much for low memory consumption. This is our key concern. Performance, like I said, performance is considered because you know, we, we mm -hmm. were very careful with the uh, performance as much as we could, you know, making our own minimal, but that's not the primary concern. Um, and then the nice thing is now we have control of when to start and stop tracing and so on. Uh, the cons, obviously, it's, it's, uh, it's not easy to port to other architecture and it's uh, challenging to implement. And there's lots of caveats, which I didn't cover in this presentation, but there are, there are a few caveats. Uh, now, when we look at uh, the Dynance, uh, so Dynance is open source, it's well documented, so actually, this is very good. Um, the nice thing about it also is in less than 200 lines or something like that, 
we were able to write a pro the program that was doing the dynamic tracing with items. Um, I read about it in the documentation. You can see that you know like we have uh, taken performance into consideration. Uh, you can easily yeah, control uh, what to trace, when to start and stop. And then it's portable to every architecture supported by items, which seems to be very good. And it's actively maintained. Um, so the cons though is um, for embedded, we didn't find it that great in our situation because to begin with the Dynos library, it's a, it's a 100 megabyte uh, library. So how small this is an issue. And also the big thing is when you convert the whole uh, generated work data from the binary, it moves, <laughs> it takes lots of memory. So based on our experiment, okay, so that's why I put it this way because frankly we can do, you know, we play with it. I don't know if we can do full justice to Dynos. But when we played with that, we found that the 50 gigabyte binary translated into 1.3 gigabit of memory being used for our trace by our tracing application, which is a, a huge callback for us. Basically, this is a no for us. Uh, the dynamic tracing technique used on VxWorks is designed for low memory consumption and performance. Obviously, you know. Be enhanced with that, but uh, it does a very good job at it. Again, our goal being to reverse engin engineer the code and also improve performance. You know, we can improve our performance and with that too. Um, yeah, so the approach is very much targeted at VX Works on the next plan. I don't think even it would work. Um, and it's not easy to port to a tour architecture and it's uh, challenging to implement as well. So this sums up the presentation. And at the end, just, uh, they will be available by Matthew will put them online. Yeah. And there is extra slides for whoever is interested to look at the, some other details. Questions? I wonder if the experience approach doesn't have a higher performance and then because it gives a trap each in twice for the function of the microsoft. Yeah. So yeah, you basically you commented on the uh, on the traps, right? Yeah, the two approaches to um these jumps, regular jumps. And yeah. this works in one that one instruction trap for the rooted function and the other bit. And I don't know that tracks being expensive. So. Yeah, so like I said, the goal is it, our goal here is not to have the minimal impact on the system, but we use that tool to explain the performance. So in the grand scheme of things, although you know, like there is a cost, when you look at how long it takes to run that function and so forth, when you look at the numbers, you can still figure out you know where are the all the next one of that. And that's really what we use a tool for. So it served the purpose of doing that. Uh, and also, like I said, like performance-wise, like LTT and G and a lot of other people, like, like your purpose uh, presenter, it's all about performance. In this case, it's more about having a tool to trace a code so you can improve the performance of that code, but we're not so concerned about the, uh, the impact of the system. Although we try to make it as minimal as possible. So uh, <coughs> allow me to uh, defend the list a bit. Uh, okay. So number one, it comes from HPC environment and it has been designed in a, in a full program instrumentation in mind. Their use case is to pick up a couple of functions per thread and monitor on the They put all the open MP craziness behind and they don't want to focus on their you know, tight loop of, of their stuff. Mm -hmm. So that's number one. Uh, number two, I'm pretty sure that uh, Dennis Nichols can also do the uh, branch trampoline approach. Okay. It may be part of that it doesn't do it for a set for whatever, or it just use it in a different way. Uh, I'm certain that it can do it on x 6 line mm -hmm. uh, And number three, you may have... Uh, sorry, I was going to say that you could also consider a, a different uh, 
uh, DDI tool like Elena Maria, for example, if you want to do full program instrumentation. Okay. Because it's much more efficient in this way, but now I realize that it doesn't focus. Okay. Uh, x86 are in the works. But it's just, what I was saying is that this may not be the best tool for the full program instrumentation at all. Okay. So actually, this is also why we have this presentation. Is uh, Our interest is everything to exchange you know, with the community. We want to share what we have learned. Uh, and Dynance, uh, I don't think we do, you know, like, like really we used it, we did an experiment with it, uh, we learned some stuff about it. I don't think we do full justice to Dynance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, just on the subject on the uh, huge device for generation in flight, you may want to feed back to the uh, uh, to University of uh, to the Dynance guys. They are open to this kind of feedback and stuff. Oh, yeah. So this is you one should have feedback back to them, direct to them. They so that's a good point. This is a, so one thing we want to we, we, we are considering, you know, getting in touch with them. Uh, we haven't done it. We don't know if we know where they are and all of that, but we haven't got in touch with them. Please do, because we're there. We're going to take it and all of that. But that's one thing we have in mind to get in touch with them. Uh, just to make sure I understand, so your first approach was uh, basically replacing the beginning of the function uh, with, with a branch to room in here. Okay, so uh, is it, uh, so do you have to do kind of out of line execution of that original instruction or how do you handle that? In that instruction, we basically actually have to run it, right? So we do it in the, in the prologue. So it's always the same instruction. It's yeah, so, so, so it's an instruction that's not dependent of its position in the code, right? Because other, otherwise you have to basically relocate it. Yeah. Uh, no, I don't think so. Yeah. Okay, so... Um, <coughs> that's what I was saying. I'm pretty sure the Dinans can do the same stuff, and they've already implemented all the craziness where you have to do it, it has to be relocated. Okay. Because uh, for the, I'm also curious about the x86 case, because I mean, uh, you basically need five bytes to put a call. Yeah. Uh, but just, I mean, you might be lucky and have those five bytes at the beginning of the function, perhaps not. So, yeah, so uh, there are there were some caveats uh, on x86. So at the beginning of the presentation, like the name of my peer is there. So we worked together, he implemented all of this, I'm more like the ball piece. So I have to pick his brain when listening to everything that he did. Um, so on X86, so we talked when we talked together, like we went through some caveats, right? Obviously with the X86, not all instrumentation at the same length. So you run into these issues. And then because uh, I'm personally more comfortable with more PC, um, I decided to stick to it, you know, for the for the sake of the presentation. But for for X86, X86, you know, like really we have to talk and we can ask Jason questions. Uh, because uh, there, there might be an interesting uh, al well, alternate or complementary approach to take. Uh, I've had a pointer recently. Uh, uh, so it's the X-Ray project. Okay. Uh, so uh, they're more LLVM focused at the moment. And uh, the basic idea is to add uh, uh, a small nut slide at the beginning of each function. Okay. So let's say on x 6 that would likely be a single instruction 5 byte uh, go up, okay. which can be dy dynamically patched into a call whenever the instrumentation is enabled. So it costs almost nothing at, uh, when disabled, and then you can enable it uh, without caring about is there enough space, uh, do, I, do I have to actually execute some instruction out of one. So it might be in it, so, but it requires to recompile your program with those small function uh, prologue. Uh, but it could be an interesting approach, uh, and I know the Linux kernel does it, Steve Rosted did it actually. Uh, so the function tracer, I mean the compiled, yeah, and count mechanism replaced at a post name time with a not instead for each site. So I mean perhaps we could try tricks like that, or perhaps uh, improve GCC to directly generate those not slide. I mean those could be ideas to do. And uh, you also, the next time you presented this, you talked about uh, you know, uh, using the stack for the return. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, that's that's a trick thing that we didn't do. Yeah, so yeah. that's a trick they do in the Linux kernel. So rather than instrumenting both the entry and exit, so basically uh, what you can do is push on the stack a different return address for the function, which is going to bring you to your kind of trend line before you actually exit the function. So uh, yeah, that's, that's a neat trick uh, that 
make it so that you just have to put a, put a, a header before the function, but you don't have to instrument anything at the return. Which makes it much easier. So anyway, so we are we welcome any questions or anybody who wants to talk to me after the talk. Because this is what we are you know, looking at happening for. Uh, for example, I forgot what your name is, but we didn't mention your name, but after if you can talk again and we appreciate that. And then uh, is there any more questions? I think I saw a hand.